Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, good night, wherever you are. Uh, we are here on the inaugural first ever episode of Let's Talk Security. I'm your host, Rick Ferguson. Um, this um, live vlog, video cast, whatever you want to call it, um, initially started live as an idea called Let's Talk Threats. Then, of course, uh, coronavirus hit the global pandemic. Um, hit all of us in different ways. Um, and we kind of thought that um, maybe talking threat at a time like this uh, wasn't really what people wanted to hear about. So we've decided to call it uh, Let's Talk Security. Uh, and we have uh, an absolutely fantastic uh, roster of guests to bring you. Um, we're streaming live on Trend Micro's LinkedIn, uh, on YouTube, uh, and on Twitter. So Welcome to all of you joining us on all of those platforms. We welcome your input, your comments. Um, if you want to um, send us your live questions, your live input, we'll attempt to um, to get through those uh, as much as we can. But uh, so the show is initially conceived. We're going to have a run of uh, six episodes. This being the first one, uh, possibly seven. I have a I have a fantastic and actually Trend Micro don't even know it's possibly seven yet. So Trend Micro possibly seven. Um, I have a fantastic roster of guests. Most of them are actually people that I've never had the chance to meet in person, um, including today's guest. Um, they who they are, they're people who who have a, a long and storied history uh, within the information security industry, but over and above all, they're people um, who set a great example and um, whose work and involvement I deeply admire um, and respect. So this series is going to be as much a pleasure for me as I hope it is uh, for you. Um, with that, I'll introduce the the first guest um, to you. It's uh, If you've seen the, the tweets previewing the show, you know it's a lady by the name of Katie Masuris. Uh, as I said, someone with a long and storied history within information security, um, someone who self-described yesterday to me as basically three squirrels in an overcoat. Uh, Katie, why? Three squirrels in an overcoat. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's honestly, it's it's an honor to be your first guest. It's an honor to be a guest um, of the Trend Micro podcast. And um, we are also going to be joined by my cat, Scappy, because he is right next. Here he is. This is happening already. This is happening. So Katie made it clear that there was a risk of the cat joining us. And, and there's a risk of, uh, of, of cat puke, I understand. Yeah, he already made some overtures, but we're going to hope that, that he just is distracted by our melodious voices long enough to not throw up right now on my keyboard. This is where the aim would be. But this three squirrels in a trench coat, um, you know, is really about the fact that many of us in the security industry who happen to be good in this space um, have what people refer to as neuroatypicality. And my flavors of neuroatypicality are absolutely in attention. Uh, they call them disorders, but I believe that there's an evolutionary purpose for retaining these qualities in the genome. While everyone else could perfectly well, you know, concentrate on raising food, those of us with uh, attention disorders, as they say, we're able to spot, you know, a tiger about to pounce on everyone because we notice everything, including this little guy who is uh, 15 years old and basically an old furry man who I live with who decides to do whatever he wants. So I know, I know that um, actually, you know, diversity in employment from a conversation that you and I had yesterday, actually, um, diversity in employment and opportunity in employment. Uh, is important for you and you the, what you were talking there about what people sometimes refer to as you know disorders like attention disorders and so on uh, is a part of that diversity question you now are in a in a great position as you know the ceo and founder of your own company um and you get to put your own um spin on the opportunities that you provide for the people that, that come and work for you at Luta security so why don't you tell us a bit first of all about what Luta security does because i think people know you as the vulnerability person over and above all, but I know right. that that's not 100% of you, right? There's plenty more to you than just the vulnerability story. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now with, with Luta and how you deal with uh, with the people that come and work for you? 
Well, those are both great questions. Um, Luta Security is a consultancy that works with governments, large organizations like Zoom is one of them. Um, and uh, it's been in the news recently. But we basically work on the internal processes that enable strong, solid vulnerability management and vulnerability disclosure programs. Um, I was a, a long suffering editor and co-author of the two ISO standards that govern vulnerability disclosure and vulnerability handling processes internal to an organization. So a lot of people think, oh, you do bug bounties. And I say, no, actually, Luta Security mostly advises against bug bounties because most organizations do not have the operational capacity internally to handle incoming bug reports. So effectively, you know, we try to make you pretty on the inside. No bug bounty Botox is allowed in Luta Security. Um, and we make sure of that with our customers. Um, we've worked with the UK government in designing their government-wide vulnerability disclosure program. Um, prior to forming my company, I was responsible for bringing the Pentagon to uh, fruition in terms of offering the United States government's very right. first bug bounty. And all of that was based on internal work first. And um, and then your second question about hiring. Um, honestly, it was funny at the beginning of my hiring process as I was growing my company, I was joking with my with my staff saying, we're going to have to find a white man because we don't have any yet, you know, and everything. So I, I think it's it's a, a lot of it is about your networks, right? Who who do you rely on? Who do you trust and everything? And plenty of my peers and my mentors are white males, but plenty of them aren't, right? So um, I'm lucky enough that that I have binders and binders of non-white cishet white males uh, to choose from, and we do have white males also on the team. So there's there's representation all around. But what you were talking to me about yesterday was. Um the opportunities that that you provide in terms of you'll bring someone on board and the first contract is almost like a probationary period um, yeah. and you're, there, you're more about offering an opportunity to progress in security than saying hey you must come work for me but you're welcome to yeah i think one of the things as we're dealing with you know the economy and especially the way that this pandemic has affected the economy is that We've needed to take a long, hard look at labor and labor inequality for a long time. Um, some of you probably know that I am the lead plaintiff in the um, attempted class action gender discrimination case against Microsoft. And you know that case is ongoing, but it was denied class status despite a ton of data that showed pay and promotion inequity, right? And um, when I think about labor you know, writ large, I think about the fact that I couldn't do what I do as effectively or with as many companies if I didn't have people working with me. So why would I put restrictions on their work? I look at it as, you know, labor mobility is one of the things that I find to be a fundamental right of labor, right? You should be able to work wherever you want in whatever capacity you want. So come on board as a contractor. If we like you and there's room for you, we can keep you. If right. you like the client that we've got you deployed in, it's all up front that you're allowed to move into that client with no restrictions. Because for me, you know, if, if that's a better fit for the individual, great. They may hire Luta back in someday. So it's win-win for us. And we think that rethinking labor in all of its capacities really makes a lot of sense right now. And speaking of your clients, you mentioned uh, briefly um, Zoom. Obviously, um, they are an organization with the, the lockdown, you know, the glo effectively global lockdown. Almost all of our live audience right now will be in one form or another of, of lockdown. Um, so, hey, we hope we're, we're entertaining you somewhat during that that period. Um, Zoom is a company who reached a completely new audience during this lockdown period. Obviously, they had their enterprise customers um, and they were in fairly widespread use through, through uh, a lot of companies throughout the globe. But with uh, lockdown, they suddenly found themselves being used by educational establishments, by people meeting up with friends and family. In this country, people running uh, their version of pub quizzes. Um, and obviously, I think I wrote something like, um, with great deployment comes great scrutiny. And that definitely was the case with Zoom, whether that's um, misuse and abuse of uh, poor configuration by new and inexperienced or even sometimes experienced users of the platform. Uh, but also, you know, there have been uh, vulnerabilities published. Um, were you working with them prior to this or were you brought on board as a result of this? And, and I know you may not be able to say too much. I appreciate that. Uh, what's your feeling for 
how things are going at Zoom right now? Is it a hair on fire situation? Well, no, my hair is on fire, as you can see. This is this is where the <laughs> you fire live in a volcano. Is. That's going to happen. Right. Well, there's lava behind me. Can't you see that? No. Um, where we were actually asked to come and help Zoom um, starting last summer. So we, um, Eric, the CEO, called me up, and it was after a disclosure event that that caused some headlines. Um, I'm I'm one of the judges of the Pony Awards, which is you know our industry's combination of the Oscars and the Razzies all in one. And um, you know they were nominated for lamest vendor response back in the summer um, because of a disclosure by my friend Jonathan, who had found you know, that issue where you could, uh, where you could, you know, have a proof of concept URL and, and everybody, everybody's camera would be turned on without them giving permission, et cetera. And there were some other vulnerabilities associated with his find. So Eric, the CEO had been told by multiple people that you're having disclosure problems. There's only one way, there's only one person and one company that you can go to for help and it's Luta Security. So he called us up and, you know, contract work, you know, onboarding into the vendor system being as it is, we didn't kick off that engagement until into the winter, right? And so we were doing a maturity assessment of their internal processes, giving them a baseline and recommendations. And that's normally how our engagements work, right? We are normally not in firefighting mode with a client because we are our strategic advice, we tell them how the process is supposed to work. We give them um, implementation guidance for new tools, new processes, new technology, um, because a lot of them, you know, a lot of our clients actually haven't really done uh, the, the work in terms of a secure development life cycle. So a lot of the recommendations that we have are, you know, these strategic, like you need to build these capacities and we measure across five capability areas. So we were actually wrapping up that baselining engagement when the pandemic just started, you know, really increasing people's use. And I think Zoom had said that they increased from 10 million active users a day to 200 million in the span of a couple of weeks. Well, I mean, so credit, I think, credit to them. They yeah. were one of the first organizations that actually went out there and offered their, their services to a certain extent free of charge. Um, yeah. as a response to to what was happening globally. So, you know, it's it they have to be given credit for that kind of action as well. Absolutely. I mean, the, the thing is, there are incredibly dedicated people who are working at Zoom right now. And it's not just the outside consultants that you've heard about, you know, like myself and others, you know, we've got uh, Leah Kistner, we've got Matthew Green working on the end to end encryption, we've got Alex Stamos, we've got Trail of Bits, Bishop Fox, NCC Group. It's not just all of us sort of named security people. There are tons of internal people, engineers, security people in every department who are literally meeting all the time to try and make the security better. So I know there is, I know from observation that there is a sincere effort going on and, you know, we're all there to help. So right now, you know, Luta is in a new position with them where we're actually helping them to physically build out their capacity. So Luta is actually hiring right now um, and we'll, we'll have a careers page up probably later and I'll tweet a link to it. Very but cool. essentially, yeah, it's very cool. And it's exciting because, you know, Coming from Microsoft um, and watching the biggest software company in the world struggle to refine its capabilities in this area, even though I joined when it already had a fully functional Microsoft Security Response Center, I'm lucky enough that some of the people on my team were the founders of that original Security Response Center. So they've seen, you know, from the very first beginnings of this new threat model that Zoom is under. And we're able to bring that kind of knowledge and experience, um, you know, to bear in creating their new vulnerability response program. So right now, there's no operational changes. Right now, I think they're they're running on a few different bug bounty platforms right now, and all of those operations are still the same. But we are kind of doing this back end build out, and we're going to have recommendations for changes and you know differences. And right now, the bug bounty programs are private. You know, there will be a time in which we should be able to make them public, right? Right now, it's just vuln disclosure is public and bug bounties are still invitation only, but we're working on all those things. So it's exciting. It's really exciting. So you, 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 it definitely sounds like, and you you sound quite passionate about it as well. Um, it sounds like that's a company that does get to say, we take your security seriously. Yeah, well, they're definitely taking it very seriously. It's not it's not just uh, bringing us all in and having us, you know, not do anything. It right. is uh, it's a lot of work and it's exciting work. So we're all really happy to be there. I've followed you on Twitter for a long time. And obviously, you know, you, you are like it or not, your your 
backstory, your history within the industry anyway, is intertwined with uh, bug bounty programs, vulnerability disclosure. Um, mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's totally your track record. Um, so I've been consistently surprised because you and I haven't had the chance to have a conversation face to face or even do karaoke, um, yeah. which I would love to do. Um, I've been surprised to uh, to see you tweet on more than one occasion um, advising against bug bounty programs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not always you know a panacea. It's not uh, it's not always the solution to every problem. What why is that? What 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 is wrong with running a bug bug bounty program? Well, look, it, think of it like a like a human body, right? If you lack the digestive system for what you're already dealing with, like every organization has to deal with vulnerabilities in deployed products, right? Not even products that, that they are writing or creating, but the technology that they use, right? If they're running a website, what is, what is underlying that? And they need to maintain the patches. If they're lagging behind in even their vulnerability management or patch management for technology they don't even create, they don't have really the digestive system that is capable of managing sort of this ongoing bug reporting. I mean, I was a penetration tester for seven years and it was in the earliest part of the security industry. So I remember this arc of, oh, if we just tell them about the bugs, they'll get better at it and magically it will, you know, they'll they'll fix them and they won't make those same mistakes again. But quarter after quarter, every client was having the same, not just even the same instances of bugs they hadn't gotten around to fixing, but they were continuing to make the same coding mistakes or deployment mistakes and having the same classes of issues show up. So when I say, don't do a bug bounty until you can handle the vulnerabilities you already know about. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that people don't have, you know, their their digestive system in order. And then I call it bug foie gras. You do not want that happening. To <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember there was a big movement. I can't remember how long ago it was now, um, but I do remember it definitely being a thing for for a while, which was no more free bugs. You remember? You remember when that was a uh, oh, yeah, yeah no, no more free bugs. Um, Yep. Th that, that necessitates was... the fact that you're going to have people paying for for uh, bug disclosure, right? That that if there's no more free bugs, then people want money for the, the research work that they've done, and that's totally normal. Um, but there's a question of pricing and value and market distortion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously at Trend Micro, we run the ZDI, which is another uh, bug bounty program, mm -hmm. one of the one of the biggest in terms of numbers out there, and we have a pricing structure for that. I know that you you have spoken in the past about I think it was the million dollar bug bounty that was offered for for iOS uh, vulnerabilities, and how you were saying that's absolutely not tenable. Um, this this kind of thing does far more uh, creates more harm than good. Um, what's the story there? Why? What's the story of the pricing? And the reason I f I'm asking the question is because I it's interesting to try and work out, because I know that you were, um, you instigated, I think, the Microsoft uh, Blue Hat Prize mm -hmm. uh, and the, the grand prize there at the time, and it was a few years ago now, uh, it was like $200,000 was yep. one single grand prize, right? So what's reasonable, where's the line, and why is too much too much? That those are all great questions. So I, I was um, lucky enough to be able to do some academic research along with colleagues at MIT Sloan School and Harvard Kennedy School a few years back on the vulnerability economy and exploit market. And one of the key issues that one of the questions that we wanted to tackle was actually based on, do you remember Dan Gear did an amazing keynote at Black Hat, I think it was 2013, 2014, something like that. Mm -hmm. And part of what he said was, if vulnerabilities are dense in software, as in there's a lot of them, then outbidding the black market or buying up all the bugs won't really make a dent, right? But if software has a low density of vulnerabilities, then it might be possible to buy up the most critical bugs and maybe offer 10 times the amount of, let's say, the black market. I hate using the black market term. It's actually the offense market. It's yeah. uh, law enforcement could be part of the offense market. This isn't yeah. an elite. Government's probably one of the biggest consumers. Yep. Right? Um, yeah, exactly. Well, no. So 
ZDI is in the defense market because you're buying the bugs and you're giving them to the vendor to fix. So any yeah. buyer who is giving the bug to the vendor to fix is counts as defense market. And then any buyer, whether lawful or unlawful, um, who is buying the bugs in order to use them to exploit something and doesn't want the vendor to fix it quite yet, or if at all, is in the offense market. So sure. I, I take issue also when people say you either do a bug bounty or you're a bad person. I think there's there's a lot of misalignment as to what what makes you a bad person. Why, and, why would someone say that? That sounds like the weirdest. Because that, they're assuming that the black market is all criminal, right? Or all foreign nation states or, you know, or whatnot. So they're assuming that there's only one good way to sell bugs. And that's just not true. Um, but back to the pricing, right? So. Yeah. Pricing um, is important. So one of the things that we addressed was looking at it as a complex system, right? No market is simply, you know, one lever, price up, price down, supply and demand. No market is that simple, right? So this is actually a system dynamics exercise. And what we found in our system dynamics research and our, our um, looking at some of the models that we created was that if you think of um, the most effective lever to tip the scales in favor of defense, it's not price. Price, you have a logical limit. If you go above a certain price in the defense market, you start cannibalizing other functions of the defense market. Other functions like finding because the bugs before them the or... Right, well, other, other functions like finding the bugs before they're released to the public, right? Uh, writing more secure code in the first place. Right. So through development, testing, all of those things that should happen in-house before you start paying outsiders, right? Because paying outsiders like professional penetration testers and everything, and even bug bounty hunters, if you're putting the, the prices sky high, it becomes the least efficient and most expensive way for you to vet invest your security dollars. So you create a perverse incentive. Dilbert had a cartoon about it in 1995, you know, with the pointy haired manager saying, I'm going to offer a bug bounty for every bug. And Dilbert and his friend go off and say, I'm going to write me a minivan, you know, so they're going to yeah. put bugs in the code to then, you know, maybe collude with an outsider or something, or, or maybe if the bug bounty is offered internally, just collude with other employees to essentially mint money. So we have to watch these incentives really carefully and not just assume you can outbid or you need to raise prices or all of these things. Those are- the line. How, how does a company, um, how does a company decide the right price to offer, the right value to put on a head? Well, that's one of the things that Luta helps them understand, right? We look at what are you doing to prevent these bugs in the first place? Do you have the tools and do you have the processes and do you have the people with the knowledge to actually run these and make them effective? And if the answers are no, they can keep pouring money into their bug bounty program, but they're going to keep making those same mistakes over and over again. So it kind of makes no sense. So we help redirect some of their resources in an appropriate way, because for us, it's more important to see them get better over time. Right. Right now, I think the bug bounty platforms are caught in one business model, which is everyone must bounty all all, you know, all roads lead to bounty. And what that does is that because they don't have any other, you know, sort of service offering there, basically they do better the least mature their customers are, right? So as long as their customers are have a lot of low hanging fruit bugs, their bug bounty hunters have a lot of fishing ground, right? Fertile fishing ground. And, um, you know, they're not really incented to help their customers get better and make smarter investments over time. You should be going from a lot of low hanging fruit bugs to few and fewer bugs that are more and more complex, right? You should be going from bug density to bug scarcity. And that's that's what we try and help people figure and out. And would you, would you advise your customers in general terms that when you're in the, the bug density phase, that's not the time when you start instituting bug bounty programs. You've got a whole lot of other stuff to fix before you start going down that road. Yes, and I think that a lot of people, and we're seeing the we're seeing the cracks in the facade of the marketing, you know, bug bounty platforms. You know, we're we're now uh, four years after Hack the Pentagon, which really kind of opened things up for for a lot of people because it was, you know, it was not just a major government; it was the biggest military, you know. Yeah. Uh, the world has ever known, right? Saying, actually, we need help from hackers. Um, so that was a big deal. So we were four years from that inflection point. And what we're seeing is that, you know, 
a lot of the marketing strategy is just start a private bug bounty program and, and see, and you have no risk because it's not, you know, it's all under NDA and it's private and everything. And then you can see where, you know, the holes are and then go fix it. The problem with that mentality is that the majority stay in private mode. So what does that do to vuln disclosure? A lot of these companies don't understand that having only one front door and it's locked by an NDA on a bug bounty platform means that the majority of high value researchers will refuse to ever report a vulnerability that they find. So guess what? You're gonna be limited to the pool of researchers who are willing to sign that NDA and just kind of get paid a little bit of money and not worry about whether or not that bug gets fixed. So a the NDA of, is, oh, yeah. you're talking about an agreement that says, um, we're never gonna talk about this and neither are you. Like there'll be no disclosure yeah. whatsoever, that kind of NDA or something different. Yeah. No, the, the bug bounty platforms all have a terms of service NDA. So if you sign up for an account and decide to report a vulnerability through them, even if it's to a vuln disclosure program, not a bug bounty program, like even if there's no cash exchange to you as the, the reporter of the issue, the terms of service require you to get permission from you know whoever it is who's running the, the bone disclosure program before you publicly disclose. Now that includes things that the customer may have rejected as saying, I'm not gonna fix that, or we don't think it's a security bug. You're still bound under NDA mm -hmm. on those platforms. And so a lot of researchers absolutely refuse. And frankly, it's creating friction where it was supposed to be removing friction from the vuln disclosure process. And that's honestly, that's that's a tragedy. It's it's something that didn't need to happen and didn't need to kind of grow that way. But I think that it is because there there is no other way to get new customers um, who aren't ready, right, for the full vuln disclosure public program or bug bounty program. There really isn't a way to get them unless you offer them this private NDA, which frankly, your money is better spent with professional pen testers. If you're going to have researchers NDA, under NDA, just hire some pen testers. Just hire them, right, and reduce yeah. that density till you're at, at the place. I can right. see some stuff coming in, uh, questions coming in. Marco uh, from LinkedIn wants to know, this is unrelated to what we were just discussing, but it's an interesting question because I have some skin in the game. I don't know about you. Uh, what do you think about um, certifications, um, you know, industry certifications, info security certifi uh, certifications um, that require you to pay year on year to maintain the certification that you've already earned. I guess I just asked a really loaded question there. I think my own opinion shone through in the question that I asked. Uh, I've been public about it in the past. I, I, through the course of my career, which has gone on for for for, for many years, have done various different certifications, and it slowly began to grate on me personally, so this is my opinion, Marco, it slowly began to grate on me that I had to pay dues uh, every year for something which I had already demonstrated um, that I deserved under the terms of the, the certification. And I'm still working in the industry. So, you know, why should I have to uh, prove that I'm maintaining my knowledge and over and above all prove that I'm giving you money every year? I let, personally, I've let every single one of those lapse and uh, I'm not a certified anything anymore other than I think um, I don't think MCSE expired and I don't think uh, Cisco networking essentials uh, expired uh, and I think that's about the only ones that are probably still current what, what do you think Katie well uh, I think I got a CISSP I think in 2000 or 2001 um, and I was an independent penetration tester so back then um, it was useful to have my name listed uh, you know as a an official yep this, you know, this certificate number checks out because I would do a lot of freelance work and hiring managers and HR departments back then were the same as they are right now, which is they don't have a really good way to screen for people. And so that was just a tool that I used in my independent uh, right. penetration testing. So as soon as I had joined at stake, which um, actually um, when you were mentioning no more free bugs, I was I was saying, uh, yeah, that was one of my former at stake colleagues, Dino uh -huh. Dizem, um, who, and and uh, Alex Sodorov, um, who's actually at Trail of Bits with the other, with the, uh, you know, some of the consultants here. So anyway, um, but the, the point is, once I joined At Stake and I didn't have to market myself, At Stake was taking care of the marketing, um, I found it unnecessary to maintain that certification. Now, 
just so you know, I never uploaded any CPE credits. I just paid the money and they kept my name up there. So there you go. Interesting. Um, okay. That's a nice insider tip. Yeah. I used to yeah. religiously do my credits all the time. Uh, last minute, of course. I mean, that's the only way to do your CPEs, I think, last minute. Um, but I guess you're right. It 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 was useful. It's not. It's it's really unfair for me to go. That was a totally useless thing. I wish I'd never done it. I did a CISSP. I did the ISSAP uh, concentration after that. Um, uh, I did a CEH, some other stuff. It was useful to me at the time, that's for right. sure, and it definitely enabled me to get roles um, because all of my my background was all technical. It was uh, I spent over a decade in tech support, fixing broken stuff in a back room and, and you know, didn't interface with anybody beyond the customer whose problem I was fixing. So to be able to break out of that and do something, I moved into um, architecture, security and privacy architecture design stuff. I couldn't have done that without those certifications, without something in my hand that said, here's my proof that I can do this, give me a job. But I think there comes a point where you have to look at that stuff yourself and say, am I still getting value for money? And if you're not, don't be afraid of stopping paying don't be afraid afraid of letting it lapse right we've i guess we've both done it then in that case yeah and i think i think that's really what it is kind of back to picking up the thread on labor mobility i think it's it's an important part of how our current system works especially given that computer science itself is one of the youngest sciences and computer security as a discipline is even younger than that and um you know I'm in my mid 40s, but we were, you know, we were among the first generation of professional security professionals, right? Um, and I think that the certifications are sort of the shortcut way um, to to provide that that piece of paper for for job mobility, for for um, you know expanding your roles and expanding the things that you can do. Um, do I wish there was a better way? Will I work on a better way? Of course, I will work on a better way. But until then, and it will not be certificate based. I can tell you that. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's interesting you talk about the first generation of, of uh, computer security professionals. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm slightly older than you. I'm going to reach my half century this year. So that's a scary proposition. We still uh, get school together, so we're close. <laughs> right. I got big bands of gray under here. That's why the long hair keeps it all, keeps it all oh, hidden. Oh, yeah. no, it's gray hair. Oh, you can't quite see it. It's gray. But, you know, the, one of the few things I haven't had to worry about that I've heard so many people complaining about during the pandemic is hairdressers. I, I couldn't care less. <laughs> There's nothing to do here. <laughs> no, uh, um, this is something I I am incapable of dealing with myself. So it's just going to be what it is. That color looks like a, a work of art color in itself, though, like doing color matching on that. I, I, I wouldn't fancy my chances. No, this, uh, I think I meant, might have mentioned, I don't have to really dye this very often because it's so damaged, it's practically a tattoo. So that's pretty much how it's pink forever now. <laughs> how has lockdown been for you? How long has it been and how has it oh, been? It's been a long time. It's uh, It started the day after I got back from RSA um, because I live in Washington State and uh, this is, you know, was initial COVID outbreaks. Right. So yeah, lockdown has been pretty intense um i finally oh i think if my amazon is telling me correctly that i might receive my very first toilet paper shipment of the entire lockdown today. oh my word i know it's it's like it could be an emergency problem. situation after so yeah. much time. no no i was already a toilet paper hoarder but you know my supplies were running below my comfort level <laughs> this is this is like another reference to squirrels only this time with toilet paper you've been squirreling yeah. toilet paper away I really have, yeah. You know what? We have an Amazon subscription for, for that as well. And mm -hmm. ours arrived, a giant box of it arrived the week before lockdown started. So I could walk along the aisles of empty shelves taking photos and tweeting them and thinking it was hilarious. But I don't know. I guess sales of those Japanese toilet seats must have really gone up during this period in time. You know the, the kind that oh, I mean? Yes, the ones with the automatic bidet functions and everything. My, yeah. my favorite toilet toilets in the world are in Japan. I didn't expect this broadcast to go down this avenue, but as soon as we're here, well done, Japan. Yeah. Your toilets are, are fantastic. Uh, keep it up. Um, another question, this, this one has come uh, on LinkedIn and actually refers back to something you said earlier on about secure development lifecycle. Um, this is someone who heard you um, speak uh, about secure coding practices uh, that impacts software security uh, and what changes you have seen over your professional lifetime in the area. Are people, are we getting better? Is it improving or are, do you still throw up your hands in horror and, and, and thank, thank the Lord for more customers? Well, 
all of the above, right? I, I see people improving because no developer wants to write bad code, right? They, they don't wake up every day and say, why don't I write a completely insecure function today? Um, so people want to get better. They're often not sure how. Actually, in the old days of at stake, um, we taught an application security class. And the way we taught it was presume that they have no prior background in security and explain you know, vulnerability classes, how they're exploited, and then let them try it. And then when you let them try it, it tends to kind of be this big aha moment. And, um, and, and they tend to take it more seriously and want to prevent those kinds of bugs. But so yes, they're getting better with education and, and training, especially if it's hands-on training, showing them how to use, uh, how to use even an exploit framework is, is eye-opening for a lot of IT professionals who've never run Metasploit, right? Mm -hmm. But what hap what's happening, and this actually came out in our labor market study, you know, with MIT Sloan Harvard Kennedy School, um, is that there's an influx of new people and they are absolutely green and they are cutting and pasting from the same stack overflow snippets of code and they're flawed, right? So we actually get more vulnerabilities from code reuse, which is why actually I think GitHub's um, solutions to that, and yes, they're owned by Microsoft now, but I remember when they were coming into play of trying to build in things that made it really hard for developers to, for example, include out of date libraries in their code. It would throw up a warning and say, no, no, we're gonna replace it automatically with the with the newer version and everything. So I think education is part of it, but you, you know, you're constantly educating all the new developers who are coming in. I think building better frameworks, things like what Git, uh, GitHub is doing um, in terms of making it harder for developers to make the same classes of mistakes when they're coding, that is all incredible um, effort, but we, we still have a long way to go. And I think all the coding boot camps that are teaching people to code and opening that job up for many more demographics than we're ever able to access the profession are great, but I worry that they're probably, just like universities, not teaching secure development. They're just a they're narrow focus on the coding well. element of it, right? Just Yeah, just yeah. getting it, it coded right, it, it doesn't often include any security knowledge. I think when I testified before Congress on the Uber data breach, one of the things, you have to tell Congress what to do at the end. You say, here's why you have me as an expert. This is what I think of this issue, and here's what Congress should do, right? So in the here's what Congress should do part, uh, one of the things I said was, um, publicly funded universities should have a requirement for at least computer science majors to take a security class. Um, I think it was the survey that I had, had cited said that of the top 10 US universities computer science programs, none of them required security. And uh, I think only three of them had them even as electives. So wow. we, don't, we don't have the educational pipeline to build secure coders. We're, we're building bug writers, not software developers, right? And I, th I think there's another side to it too. Certainly what we see at Trend Micro when it comes to uh, cloud uh, and, and the development of cloud as a platform um, through infrastructure service um, to uh, you know, platform as a service through Docker and, and then true serverless deployments, as the coding models that people are using, the infrastructure behind those coding models um, changes, then you're subject to um, new elementary mistakes that you didn't know existed. And the vast majority of um, vulnerabilities per se, not, not code vulnerabilities, but vulnerabilities anyway that can be exploited uh, in cloud deployments are through misconfiguration, are through uh, reuse of vulnerable code libraries, uh, or are through people accidentally leaving secrets within uh, containers or images or whatever it may be. Um, so I think there's, as well as the fact that people are not learning security in coding, the ground is constantly shifting under professionals anyway uh, and obliging them to, to, to apply security in completely new formats on an ongoing basis. And that's, that's never going to change, I guess. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of stuff that we've learned from watching um, Actually, the most recent one that I can think of was WannaCry, right? And the mm -hmm. patch was available ahead of time, ahead of the worm outbreak. Yeah, right, people right. Hadn't, right, people hadn't applied it, and then the worm, you know, ripped its way through the internet. Now, post WannaCry, you would think that SMB version one would just kind of disappear from the internet because you're vulnerable to, to WannaCry with that enabled. But I think, to your point about cloud, I think a lot of people 
said, oh, we don't want to be vulnerable and we don't want to be responsible for the upkeep. So let's just put stuff in the cloud. What's interesting is that people didn't understand that, you know, they had to be specific about the type of management that they wanted in the cloud. So we actually saw an increase in exposed SMB version one subsequent to uh, a lot of cloud migrations. So that's a very yep. interesting point about, you know, people thinking the cloud is going to solve all their problems, but they haven't actually, um, you know, taken advantage of the, the you know, the, the cloud feature of having the security managed for you. I think they, yeah. I think organizations assume it's just included. Right? It's something that my colleague, Mark Manikoven has spoken a lot about in the past. And actually he has his own, uh, he, he started this Let's Talk series with Let's Talk Cloud. He's done a couple of seasons already. Um, and something that I have heard him speak about on multiple occasions is the lack of understanding of the shared responsibility model. People just assume that, hey, I, I'm using cloud now. Security right. is their responsibility. I should be cool. After all, I can rely on provider X, right? Yes. And, and not deploying the, the technology. So there's another, another question come in, um, and this again refers back to what we were talking about earlier on, um, what you called bug density. And, and uh, somebody has uh, added in an element of, of COVID-19 to the question as well. What is the best way for people to flatten the bug density curve? Nicely worded question. Right. Actually, he said, what is the best time? I'm reading it right here. What is the best oh, that's time? Me not, I'm deliberately not wearing my glasses because that's my vanity shining through. <laughs> um, okay, so the the best time to flatten the bug density curve. Um, ideally, you are doing education of your developers on secure coding before even the design phase. But most organizations have not done that, right? They throw some code up, they're fast to market, and then they kind of deal with security bugs in the um, in the reverse order of what the ideal is, right? They deal with the flood of what they missed, and that's their vulnerable response program that usually goes into effect well before their secure development lifecycle program does. These are just, I'm not judging anyone, I'm just saying these are facts of the market. Yeah, it's just it's just occurs, right? I mean, it occurred with Microsoft too, right? They had a rude awakening with the earliest, you know, waves of worms ripping yeah. through the very early internet, and their first move was stop the bleeding. So, stop the bleeding is part of that bug density curve flattening, but you're never going to catch up, and you're always going to be playing whack a bug if you don't then go in and start putting you know, putting security into every step of your secure, of your software development life cycle. A lot of people also think that, well, that works great, you know, in the old fashioned waterfall, you know, development style of Microsoft, but where Agile and everything, there's, there are guides on how to fit secure development, you know, into appropriate places in Agile as well. So I think being practical about bugs and bug density, it's, Stop the bleeding, deal with your vulnerability response situation, and then investigate areas where you can improve and start eliminating classes of vulnerability. That's actually part of the maturity assessment we do. You know, we, we show you your baseline and then we tell you, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, then you're actually going to be reducing <clears throat> the overall number of bugs that you have to deal with. And ideally, they won't be as serious, right? Okay. And how, so one of the big changes in recent years uh, from a coding perspective and with its massive knock-on effects into security as well, um, has been adoption of DevOps type processes uh, within uh, coding organizations. Right. What impact have you seen that having? Well, I mean, it can be good or bad, right? If it's too fast in terms of deploying, um, you know, potentially a fix that is not complete. Right. If the investigation of the vulnerability that they're trying to address is, you know, doesn't identify the correct root cause or it only addresses one vector to exploit that root cause and misses a bunch of others. Um, DevOps, if, if executed sort of to shoot from the hip in security, can be a detriment. Right. So you really do need that, um, you know, need that technical knowledge in your team, especially among your software engineers not just the security people who are over here and the software engineers who are over here, but you really need embedded software security architecture and, and engineers who know the code base and who can understand you know, how to best service that code, even in a rapid deployment, continuous deployment type of environment. 
Speaking of code, uh, you had deep involvement in um, in Wasana, if, if um, Wikipedia is to be believed. <laughs> yes, so the Wasana arrangement, um, for those of you who have not been abused by uh, that term before, is um, it's, a, it's basically, it's a non-binding agreement. So it's not an official treaty. That apparently matters in uh, matters of state. Um, but it is a non-binding um, agreement between 41 countries, I think now 42, because India was added a couple years ago, um, that basically has them agree on export control of certain technologies. So this isn't export control of nuclear weapons. It's export control on, you know, essentially sensitive systems. So think advanced radar technology or certain kinds of lasers, that kind of thing. So all of these countries get together a few times a year and have technical experts discuss what should be on their lists of exports that require licenses. And back in the, uh, the winter of 2013, so about six months after I had launched Microsoft's bug bounty programs, um, the Wassenaar group had basically um, agreed to include something called intrusion software and intrusion software technology on the list of items that would require export licenses. Okay, translated into what we're talking about, ultimately, they were trying to basically get, you know, sort of regulation around command and control type of malware, not the endpoint malware. They didn't want to catch victims in this dragnet, you know, of who needs to apply for an export license when they cross borders or whatnot. But they didn't actually understand the unintended consequences of what they had written. And the unintended consequences were you would, as written originally, you would have to get an export license to report a vulnerability if it included intrusion software or intrusion software technology described in right. great detail. You'd also have to do it for, let's say, the WannaCry response. If you remember, it was strangers on Twitter sharing samples in real time that helped bring that thing under control. Yep, sure. There was no way to predict ahead of time, gee, I think I might need an export license to England right now or to Slovenia to talk to this other researcher. So what we did um, was so many of us around the world basically kind of wrote into our government saying this is a bad idea and you're basically going to stop all security work in its tracks because your dragnet is too wide. So fast forward, I had just started my company. This was summer or this was spring of 2016. Yep. I've been advising the Commerce Department and various departments in the United States on getting, you know, changing the U.S.'s mind on their stance, right? That was step one, working with a whole bunch of other people to change the United States mind. And then June of 2016, I get an email from the State Department saying, Katie, we would like you to join the official U.S. delegation to go help us renegotiate the Wassenaar arrangement yourself. And I was like... I've just started a startup. I yeah, have no yeah, fun. I did not expect this. I am going to Vienna now. Now I am going to Vienna. So that was an honor. It was a privilege to be able to be part of the U.S. delegation. Um, myself and Ian Mulholland, um, who was at um, VMware at the time, were the two technical experts that the U.S. brought with them as uh, you know, as the ones who were making the technical arguments to the other fellow technical experts from all the other countries. That's another thing too that people misunderstand. These people are not, you know, just much like, uh, you know, software developers who write code with security vulnerabilities. These regulators and lawmakers around the world, they're writing legal code with vulnerabilities as well. And they Absolutely. need- Absolutely, oh yes, yeah. So they're not doing it maliciously. It's, it's kind of, it was actually a mutual education process because now I know way too much about how export control works. I really do. I never wanted to learn these things. Yeah, we, I mean, there's a, a great, many great examples, I think, of um, the perils of, of um, poorly threat modeled um, legal solutions to problems. Um, and one of, one of them that, that really struck me recently was GDPR. Um, yeah. G GDPR, um, Obviously, one of the things that, that we rely on, one of the, the databases or tool sets that we rely on within security research is uh, domain name registration databases. Uh, not necessarily because criminals tell the truth all the time and therefore make it easy to find out who they are, uh, but because they often make mistakes and they'll often do things like register multiple malicious domains using the same credentials, or the same um, name and address type or email address or there are things there are commonalities that tie things together and allow you to uh, to 
classify something as malicious before it's ever used in a malicious campaign, for example. Um, one of the um, unintended effects of GDPR uh, that we've seen globally is a lot of those um, registries going dark uh, so that it, it's impossible because they hold all of this PII. Uh, they don't want to go out and get every individual's permission to make sure that it's published in a public register anymore. The easiest and safest thing for them to do to make sure they stay on the right side of the law is simply to stop publishing that information. So actually, while GDPR has done an awful lot of good things, there have been unintended negative consequences to it. And it's because legislation or regulation like that very often doesn't involve professionals from the industry, which is why your involvement in, in Wassenaar was so instrumental to having something which was significantly more useful than it was before you were involved, I guess. Well, I mean, at least we know that you know, competitions like Pontone, for example, that the ZDI runs, um, which I also refer to as an exploit art walk. I love that competition. Um, but, you know, that's an annual exploit competition, um, you know, done in uh, Canada and Japan as part of Cansec West and, um, and, uh, what is, what is the Japanese version of Cansec called? I'm forgetting right now because the squirrels were off. What is it? <laughs> and we did it in Florida too now. We did it, uh, yeah. we did it in, in, uh, an industrial. Um, industrial IoT one um, down in, in, in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that was the most recent one. Well, pre, uh, pre this year's CanSec West, which was done all remotely for obvious reasons, uh, but it still went ahead. And the you know we had uh, uh, we had ZDI staff on site uh, running the exploits that they were being uh, instructed to run by the competitors. So we still found a way to make it work remotely. Uh, right. But yeah, prior to that, we did an industrial one, which was the first time ever, and then. Uh, this year and last year, we obviously had the, the, the Tesla as one of the things to, to be hacked. Mm -hmm. So it's been going from strength to strength. You know, it's, it's weird. Um, the tipping point acquisition, I forget, I'll get crucified at Trend now, I forget which year it happened, but we made the acquisition of tipping point. Um, that was a really sensible thing for Trend Micro to do. It's fantastic technology. Uh, but we were also prepared to put investment into it. And ZDI came as part of that acquisition. And, you know, I've been in the industry for um, like 25 years in the industry in various forms anyway over that time. Um, and I saw Tipping Point go from home to home to home. And it really feels like Tipping Point and ZDI uh, have kind of found their spiritual home. Uh, Trend's a very special company with a very special culture. And Tipping Point has just dropped right into to being a part of that Trend Micro family and it's great to see the investment that's gone into something like ZDI because I remember I think it was Pwn to Own Mobile was at risk of of not happening anymore this was pre-acquisition right because of Wasana it yes. was the one that was happening in Tokyo I think it might have been cancelled one time but yeah, yeah it was, was yeah, it was canceled because of Wassenaar, uh, because it was unclear. And actually, we had, you know, we had a hacking competition that was run by Hack in the Box um, over in uh, Abu Dhabi just this last October. And Luta Security was actually brought in to help make sure that nobody violated export controls because right. this was in a country that's outside of all the Wassenaar countries. So we knew that there was going to be export control situations no matter what happened, um, especially it, it matters in the exemptions that we got, what your role is, right? So we had to we had to do a lot of segmentation um, work on the fly to make sure that, for example, even the judges who were from different countries and everything were not actually getting direct access. No, no technology transfer to the judges occurred, right? Because we created an impromptu skiff. We basically like collected people's devices, uh, you know, before they went into the room. But there was a lot of this physical segmentation that we had to do in order to make sure that only the reporter of the bug and the recipient of the bug were the ones who got the bugs and the exploits directly. We watched the demonstrations, but we saw no code and we received no code. We did no pass through, right? Because unlike ZDI, ZDI actually does the coordination. ZDI is exempt, right? They're involved in the coordination and getting the bug fixed, they're exempt. So no matter where in the world ZDI is, you know, you guys are fine in terms of Wassenaar. This was a little bit different. There wasn't a central coordinating body involved and the judges weren't going to do that job after the competition, right? Yeah. Um, so we had to basically kind of wend our way through Wassenaar and a talk I was really looking forward to giving before the pandemic yep. and a conference I was 
really looking forward to because it's one of my favorite conferences. It's the SAS um, was canceled. It was supposed to be in Barcelona in April. Yep. And I was going to give a talk called Wasson, Are You Serious? <laughs> <laughs> Look, who says dads are, get all the dad jokes? Okay, I'm just saying. Um, but but it was going to be about that competition, and the 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 leading um, the abstract said, "Have you ever found yourself almost accidentally becoming an international cyber weapons dealer in the Middle East?" We did, right? So that was the lead in to to the adventure that was that competition. But yeah, everything about export control you never wanted to know. That's a shame. You're going to keep that presentation on hand, I hope, for for other events when events resume whenever that may be, or maybe yeah. for a virtual place. It sounds like a very cool presentation. Well, and you know, a lot of conferences have gone virtual, but frankly, I'm virtualed out. I decided to do this with you because it was live and I could just, you know, just existentially like deal with it and everything. But yeah, I've said no to pretty much everything else. So you got it, you know. Yeah, I I, I feel your pain. I, do you know what I was, I, because this was the first uh, episode of the first season and, and the first time I've done a live internet broadcast of any description. I thought I was really nervous about this. Having a chat with you last night really helped. Turns out um, why the reason why I was nervous about today is because I had a webinar to do this morning and I just hate doing webinars. Um, it's it, You can make all the greatest content in the world and, and I thrive on trying to inject a little bit of humor in my presentations to bring the audience along, but you need to be able to look people in the eyes and, and feel the emotion in the room and kind of take people with you um, so webinars are foreign territory. I, I really admire the people who are really skilled at them. We have a couple within Trend Micro, John Clay being a, a great example, does does uh, uh, regular webinars for Trend Micro, and he is a consummate professional. I, I just find it so difficult to find my pace. Apologies if anybody watching was on the webinar this morning. It was great because we had a live Q&A afterwards and webcams were on and stuff, so that was all good. But uh, I, it, I, I find it really hard. So I feel your pain, fully feel your pain. Um, net, net, what's an arm? Good, bad, worthwhile, not worthwhile, help, hindrance? So net, net, um, we got the ex exceptions that we needed to operate in the meantime. There are still unanswered questions and areas that could could use improvement in and clarification in the existing language. For example, there's still no real clarification on tools. Right. Um, we've gotten, you know, the exemptions for intrusion uh, software, intrusion software technology or, you know, but but not tools and tools. Think of tools like Metasploit and other things, even custom yeah. scripts that will, you know, do some of the actions that are described in the Wassenaar arrangement um, are potentially licensable through export control. And we haven't quite gotten those ambiguities sorted out. So I think there's more work to do, but it's also kind of like we got the most important bits done. And I think the will to continue to go back to that same, you know, piece when that group handles, like I gave a couple of examples, right? Advanced radar, lasers, all kinds of other things, drones, you know, there, there's so much to work on in that group. And I think that, you know, the priorities have shifted for sure. But we'll, you know, that's the same group, by the way, that um, gave us the crypto wars back in 1999, right. yeah, yeah, sure. That was pretty much, you know, the cohort. And um, it was interesting because they remembered that differently than we do, right? So I they was, remembered uh, it. I was working for PGP at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. That was a big deal for us back then. Yeah. Well, the the folks in the you know in the 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 Wassenaar group remembered it differently because they were saying things like, "Well, yes, we you know we've heard your complaints before, security industry, and we worked through them with you, and eventually came to where you know where we are today with it." And I said, "Yes, but in the meantime, you realize what happened with that temporary." ban that you had and restriction was that you forced down leveling of all browser encryption yeah. and that made e-commerce very very insecure for a very long time and and you know as an industry and society it took us longer to recover from that than what your vision is seeing which is oh no we, we wrote the rules a little bit too too narrowly and then we opened them up a little bit and everything's fine now and i'm like no. yeah we fixed it and it's all good don't worry about it there was no negative yeah. outcome everything's fine yeah. So, I mean, you know, they they also thought that since they had regulated software before, that regulating software in the same manner, you know, that they were doing uh, starting in 2013 would be, you know, similar, maybe painful adjustments at the beginning, but they'd get to a good place. Whereas the way they had written it, it was essentially 
what computers do, you know, was what was how they had written it. It's like, no, yeah, this is how computers sure. work, actually, you know. So I'm conscious that we're coming up on the hour and I've taken up a lot of your time and I'm really grateful for it. I just wanted to ask one question which has literally occurred to me just now. So I haven't given it, it's been unfair and I haven't given you any warning of this at all. Um, but this whole, seeing as this is Let's Talk Security, the lockdown sessions, um, this is a, a societal situation which is unfamiliar to all of us. It's a family situation that's unfamiliar to all of us. We all have different concerns and, and, and different things going right and different things going wrong. What lessons um, have you learned, whether it's personally, professionally, socially, whatever, what lessons have you learned from this completely unique experience that we're going through right now um, that you would hope to carry over uh, once you know we're through the darkest part of the tunnel? That is a, that is a really good question. Um, you know, one thing that, that I, I know that a lot of parents like me are struggling with is doing your day job while caring for your kids when you have no help. And I'm a single co-parent, which means when my kids are with me half the time, um, that's it. You know, I have to balance all of these things. And I think that, you know, myself as an employer of other people, uh, the way that I've been able to, you know, live our company values and live my own personal values with the employees is just making sure that, you know, they have everything they need. If they have any, you know, pandemic related concerns or issues they need to deal with, it's just kind of no, no question, just go deal with it. And honestly, um, I am seeing people, not just at my company, but other companies, they're focusing themselves in a very different way. It's not about, um, presenteeism at work anymore because it's not when you showed up at the office and when you left it's more about drawing boundaries around when is working time and when is family time when it's all occurring in the same physical space so i try to make room for that for myself and for the people who work for me and i'm seeing and and cheering on the people who are doing it for themselves and really you know there's never a work life balance that's a lie it's all trade offs but i'm seeing people choose the most important people in their lives, myself included, um, as the priority. So I have hard st start and stop times for my work day and my, yep. my people's work day. And um, I get mad when people bug me on the weekend, even my own team. I'm like, stop it, leave me alone. It's family time. <laughs> and, and you and you try and I guess project that to them as well that says you need to, when you check out, you need to be checked out. Stop, uh, you know, don't, mm -hmm. don't live in your, in your email account. Don't live in your, you know, professional, social, whatever, check out, look after the people that count. That's that's exactly what's, I mean, I'm, I'm the parent of a one-year-old and my work days have been turned on their on their head. Um, and I just have to apply the rule that says, at the moment when, you know, when my daughter's awake, then that's not work time. And when she sleeps, then that's work time. And that's the, the only things I can apply right now. Katie, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I, I'm, I'm only sad that, we we got to do this before we got to meet in person. I have no idea why that's never happened. Uh, probably because I'm a, a, a horrible recluse at events. Um, so, but uh, I, I really hope that we can catch up in person. Uh, you've been fun, engaging, informative, everything um, that I hoped you would be. And I am super grateful to you for agreeing to be the first guest on uh, on Let's Talk Security. Thank you so much for taking part. Thank you so much, Rick. This was a pleasure. And um, unlike a lot of things where I have to be on camera, I don't feel drained. I feel energized. So thank you so much for starting. This is the start of my day. So thanks a lot for that. Have a great day, Katie. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Um, that's it. So yes, thank you, Katie, for being being our guest on this first episode of, of Let's Talk Security. Uh, it's been engrossing. The live feedback has been testament to uh, the fact that you've been engaging with uh, all of the great content that, um, that that Casey's been sharing with us. Um, thank you for joining us live. If you are watching this on Catch Up, then I'm really sorry that we had to remove Katie's karaoke rendition of Slayer's Reign in Blood for copyright purposes. So you will have totally missed that. Uh, so make sure you join the live stream next time. You never know what's going to happen uh, on Let's Talk Security. Uh, be sure to subscribe for notifications of upcoming broadcasts. And uh, with that, I've been Ron Burgundy. Um, stay classy, San Diego. <laughs>